I'm Carrie Michelli, and welcome to the second lecture on exon skipping. In this mini lecture, we'll be talking about how animal models led us to understand the mechanism of exon skipping better and how to exploit it ultimately for human trials. The MDX model is a great model for DMD in that it's uh, highly manipulable and small and easy to, to grow and uh, house. It's a dystrophin deficient mouse due to a nonsense mutation in exon 23 that leads to a premature stop and the loss of any protein expression. The curious thing is when you look at a muscle section from an MDX mouse, occasionally you see individual dystrophin positive fibers that are termed revertin fibers and they're observed otherwise on a background of largely dystrophin null uh, uh, muscle. And people began to wonder, how is it that these revertin fibers are able to rescue expression of a dystrophin protein and uh, whether or not that rescue is of any functional value? Studies by Terry Partridge and Key Liu um, led some insight into this. Here we have a slide of um, MDX muscle stained with antibody against dystrophin. And you can see that when the mice are first born, there's really very little dystrophin there, and maybe a spot or two. By four weeks, a few revertin fibers can be seen where protein has been rescued and is pro properly distributed in the sarcolemma. As the mouse ages further, more and more of these uh, revertin fibers accumulate until by 18 months they're much more frequent. Nonetheless, these are still relatively rare, maybe only 1% of, of the fibers, uh, though the fact that they persist and expand over time tells us that the protein that's being made might in fact have some functionality. It's able to make it to the sarcolemma, it's able to rescue the rest of the dystrophin protein complex, and that rescue is sufficient that those revertin fibers are stabilized such that over time there are more and more. So Terry Partridge and Key Lu were quite interested in understanding what is the molecular mechanism of rescue. To begin with, what they did is first looked at the quality of the protein that was made in revertin fibers. And to that end, they took a panel of 12 antibodies recognizing different parts of the protein and stained the revertin fibers to see whether a full-length dystrophin was there or whether only a subset of the protein was there. And what you could see here is that they found, in fact, that exon 23 was always deleted. And that made some sense because that is how you could get rid of the mutation and make the rest of the protein. And what you can see is that in different re revertin fibers, sometimes just this portion encoding exon 23 was deleted, but in other cases, not only was exon 23 encoding sequences deleted, but additional sequences downstream were also deleted. So there's two possible w mechanisms by which an internally deleted DMD protein could be made. One is the DMD gene itself obtains a second site mutation such that exon 23 is deleted and uh, the reading frame stays intact. An alternate idea is that the DNA remains mutated as it, as it was at birth for this mouse and that during RNA splicing, exon 23 is forced out or skipped such that when the protein, is, when the message is spliced back together, it maintains reading frame and encodes a protein missing exon 23, which is able to function to some degree. And what they found was that if they looked at the RNA, they could see that in fact those RNAs from revertin fibers were spliced in frame. And that's a prediction of actually exon skipping, but also of the first model genetic deletion. But the second piece of data is that despite the fact that they saw no exon 23 in the RNA, they did see exon 23 in the genomic sequences. So this led to the idea that, in fact, this was likely due 
to skipping at the RNA level. And that led people to realize, well, if the cell can do it on its own, perhaps we could provide a drug that would capitalize on this process and coax the skipping to occur at a higher level, so high that you're not just making revertin fibers, but rather turning multiple uh, fibers into uh, dystrophin expressing cells. And in that way, we might ultimately be able to create something akin to a Becker. So investigators began to think about using complementary antisense nucleotides that would hybridize the sequences within the RNA and force the skip of, in this case, exon 23. And there are two major uh, oligonucleotides that have been developed and are moving forward for clinical trials currently. One is the 2-O-methyl antisense nucleotide, and the other is a morpholino. You can see that they both resemble RNA in some way, such that they can be designed to hybridize to specific sequences, but they've been modified for different reasons to enable them to be uh, more, more durable in the bloodstream and uh, perhaps to evade immune response. Here's how exon skipping would work in the MDX mouse model. As you know, the mutation is in exon 23, and normally 21 is spliced to 23 and 24, such that when the message is being transcribed, it hits the stop mutation and no protein ultimately is made because the protein fragment is unstable. If you were to force, however, the exclusion of exon 23, because exon 22 and exon 24 are in frame, those pieces can still fit together, make an in frame message, and rescue the expression of a protein that's intact, all but with an internally deleted exon 23. Because the phasing of the, the gene is um, very similar throughout this, this region of the gene, of the message, you can in fact have single skipping to rescue the dystrophin protein and reading frame, or you could have uh, skipping of three exons. If you skip exon 21, 22, and 23 is gone, now exon 20 is juxtaposed to exon 24, and that too makes a functional yet internally deleted protein. And as you saw from Terry Partridge's group, that in fact a number of these proteins are made, different sizes, lacking different regions around exon 23, such that the protein is rendered, the message is rendered back in frame and makes a functional protein. So the first example of uh, this came from Steve Wilton and Fletcher and Cole back in 1999. And what they did is they used a morpholino antisense oligonucleotide, complementary to the five prime splice site of the exon 23 transfect, and they transfected that into cultured myoblasts. After that, they waited various times, 0, 6, 18, or 24 hours, reverse transcribed the RNA, and asked PCR the product up between the regions of exon 20 and exon 26, such that what you could see is that in the unskipped uh, uh, situation at time zero, you have a large band reflecting a full-length dystrophin message, but as time went on in the context of this blocking nucleotide, you could force the exclusion of exon 23, and that can be seen with time uh, accumulating the smaller band that lacks exon 23. If you take that band out and sequence it, you can in fact see that you have created a junction between exon 22 and exon 23, demonstrating that exon 23 has in fact been efficiently removed. Now, these were in cell culture, but on an MDX myoblast. Uh, Key Lu's group, several years later, uh, brought this, this technology even further to the point where you could then now deliver these morpholinos systemically into an MDX mouse with either one injection, three weekly injections, or seven weekly injections and then the muscles were harvested from the mouse and stained for dystrophin. And what you can see on the leftmost line, uh, the C57 line, uh, shows there is some staining in different muscles 
in a wild type mouse. That's what a wild type looks like. In the MDX column, you can see very little dystrophin due to the mutation. As the antisense nucleotide is injected once, you begin to accumulate some dystrophin in the muscle. After three injections, there's more. And by seven injections, a significant amount of dystrophin has been rescued, expressed in the sarcolemma, and in some cases uh, looks quite uh, abundant, maybe as abundant as what is seen in C57 Black 6. If you take those uh, same muscles and ask whether or not dystrophin protein of appropriate size is there by Western blot, you can again see that the exon skipping has led to the rescue of dystrophin protein. The other point worth making is it's variable across the muscles. It's rescued in many. Its heart is not rescued. Many of the other muscles are rescued, but to differing degrees. Another model that's been very useful has been the dog model for DMD. And in the dog model, you need to skip two exons in order to put this, uh, this uh, message back into frame. Eric Hoffman and Shinichi Takata did some beautiful experiments in 2009 showing that Morpholino could induce exon skipping in a Duchenne dog model. And again, in the slide here, you can see that the dystrophin in wild type uh, is bright. In the untreated on the far side is the dystrophin null dog muscle. And in the center, you can see staining of dystrophin and one of its associated proteins in the muscle of the dogs that have been treated with antisense nucleotide. And as is the case I showed you before, individuals were interested to make sure that you could see whether or not the protein uh, was present. And in fact, you could see rescue of dystrophin protein of the expected size. So here are some movies of the dogs, and uh, I hope you can appreciate that the levels of dystrophin must be high enough for these dogs to uh, gain some functionality. So let's first look at what a non-treated dystrophic dog looks like at seven months of age. You can see that he's happy enough, but he's walking slowly down the hall. You can see that he's got some contractures in his legs that make it difficult for him to walk. And as he makes his way down the hallway, he begins to tire, such that the, the technicians have to really coax him along to keep going. And ultimately, he gets so tired that he slows down and uh, is barely able to, to complete the, the two laps down the hall. Lying down to rest after being done. Now let's look at a movie of a dog that's been treated five times weekly uh, and uh, then observed at seven months of age, the same age as the control animal. Watch this dog. Now he's running, he's skipping, he still has the contractures, it can't reverse that, but he seems to have much greater muscle strength. He can walk much better, and uh, the fatigue does not seem to be present anymore. By the time he makes the second lap, he's still going gangbusters, and he has absolutely no reason to need to sit down and, and take a rest. And I'll show you a second example now of an uh, individual dog who was treated 11 times uh, weekly, and he too appears to have gained um, the ability to walk and run much faster than his uh, litter mate control. The dog's happy, wagging his tail, and gladly runs after the technician down the hall without any need for a break or a desire to sit down and rest. So I find these movies very compelling. I hope you do too. It was um, the idea that this could work in a larger model like dogs helped us scale up to be able to do similar things in humans. And uh, in our next lecture, 
we'll talk about the human clinical trials involved and uh, how two companies are racing for the first FDA approval for Duchenne with drugs designed to skip exon 51 and restore reading frame and uh, dystrophin expression. <laughs>